So the shroud of Turin, medieval forgery or burial cloth of Jesus Christ, and that's the question that we're attempting to answer this evening. First of all, just a small note on relics in the Catholic Church. Relics do not form part of the faith because many non-Catholics look at Catholics and kind of frown upon us as though we worship relics, which we don't. But the church does encourage due reverence to those relics which have been deemed authentic through tradition. And scripture encourages the due respect and reverence assigned to relics. And as you would all know, with the case of Padre Peel, for example, there have been cases of Padre Peel's relics being brought into contact with someone and that exacting a miraculous cure. We read in the scriptures, Acts 5.15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so at least Peter's shadow might fall on them as he passed by. And further on in Acts 19, 11 to 12, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses left were cured and evil spirits left them. So we can see that the due respect of relics is actually found in the Bible. So it's not just a Catholic invention. The Shroud of Turin is the most studied relic in history. It's so um, so well studied that it has, has its own discipline in science. It's called the science of syndonology, um, as we can see here. Because the topic is so vast, people can devote their whole lives to studying this sacred piece of uh, cloth. Well, just some um, Shroud 101 here. What is a shroud? It's basically a fine, um, high-quality linen sheet of herringbone weave. You can see the replica copy to the, to the right-hand side. It's 436 centimetres long. Um, 110 centimetres high or wide as it were and it also has a longitudinal strip going along the top um, which we could maybe look at later on with the, the replica just along the top here. Um, the shroud shows a man's frontal and dorsal image as though the man had been crucified hence the connection between the shroud of Turin and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and all four evangelists talk about how our Lord was placed in a new tomb that was hewn out of rock and owned by Joseph of Arimathea. And we can see here how potentially someone would have been wrapped in a shroud during burial. This would be a typical tomb that one might find um, in Jerusalem at the time. So why is the shroud so controversial? Why has it um, provoked such a reaction from the public? Well, first of all, the inability to repeat and falsify the shroud itself, the image that's found on the shroud, it's impossible to formulate this. This is why it becomes an enigma. And we can see this reported by the National Agencies for New Technologies when they say that the hypothesis on how the impression was made, it's impossible to formulate that to, because we cannot replicate that today. And that's why we have this discussion. The image on the shroud is not the result of direct contact with the victim. Many people blindly believe that if we were to take a cadaver, as it were, and put it in a cloth, this is what we would get, and that's not the case. The image that we see on the shroud does not penetrate the cloth, but the bloodstains that we see on the shroud penetrate the cloth, and we'll explore that further later on. There is no sign of paint on the shroud, nor is there any brush strokes. If there were brush strokes on the shroud, if there were paint on the shroud, it wouldn't be an enigma because someone in modern times would be able to replicate that. But interestingly, the image is purely superficial. The image that you see on the shroud, when you look at the man of the shroud, the image is so faint, it's barely recognisable. But the image is one length, one uh, tenth the diameter of a human hair. I can have an analogy that you might wish to draw is if you were to look at these pews in front of you, think of how thin the coat of varnish is on the pews and compare that to the thickness of the wood. And that gives you an idea of how thin the actual image of the shroud actually is. The image has a unique pixel light phenomena where the image appears darker. It's not because there's more or darker substances, it's because there's more of that substance in that particular area. And I'm going to give, give you a wee example just to try and illustrate that point. Um, before I do that, let's just look at a blood stain, which was supposed to come up just earlier. You can see this is a blood stain on the hand, isn't it? Now, as mentioned earlier, the blood stain, the blood itself has penetrated the cloth, it has seeped in, whereas the image itself has not. We can see a picture of a person here. 
Um, from a distance, we can see whites, we can see darks, we can kind of see greys. But up close, what you actually have in this particular picture is just black and white dots. And where you see something darker, there's more black dots. Where you see something lighter, there's light, there's more white dots. But stood, taken from a distance, you start to see gradients within that. And the shroud behaves the same way. You either have brown or you have a kind of yellow colour. And it's where you have more concentration of brown. That's where you actually see the image forming. And this is a... Excuse me. This is some of the fibrils, uh, fibrils of the shroud, ladies and gentlemen, close up. And you can see this brown that we're referring to. And this brown, which forms the image, is formed by a dehydration process. But to this date, no one knows what has caused that dehydration process. So where we see more of this brown, this is where we start to see the image form. And this is essentially over the entire cloth itself. But as we can see from this picture, the brown discoloration that you see is very, very thin. It's one tenth the diameter of a human hair and it does not penetrate the cloth. It almost sits on top of the cloth. We have to look at the shroud as a mirror image. Um, if you were to take... If you were to take a wound, suppose I sustained a wound to what is the left side of my chest and I was to place a cloth over that, the blood would seep in to the cloth on that side. But if I was to then turn it over, it would appear to you on the opposite side. So when we look at the Shroud of Turin, everything has to be taken as a mirror image. So what, what is left becomes right and what's right becomes left. Does that make sense? So for example, the picture that we see here where we have the, the wound to what appears to be the man of the shroud's left side, it's actually his right side. So some early shroud history. I'm just going to move that up just slightly. There we are, some early shroud history. So in the year 544, an extraordinary image not made by human hand was preserved in Edessa, which is modern Turkey. The image is folded in such a way as to, as to display the face alone. And many scholars identified this back in the year 544 as the image of the shroud. But as you can see from the picture, we don't see the entire shroud, but we see, a, we see a shroud that's been folded in a box only to display the face alone. And this became known as the, the Mandy line. This was the name given to it when it was in this area at this time. And in the year 944, the Adisa image is then transferred to Constantinople. That became the centre of the empire at the time. And it's here that the cloth was then unwrapped so we could see an entire view of the shroud in its fullest. In the year 1144, King Louis VII visits Constantinople to venerate the Shroud of Christ. And then in the year 1204, we have Constantinople becoming occupied by the Crusaders at the time. And then, of course, all these famous relics are dispersed and many, many disappear, as did the Shroud at the time. Just as a side note, everyone, historian Ian Wilson comments that Pope Stephen III reigning from 752 to 757, comments it spread out in his entire body on a linen cloth that was as white as snow on this cloth, marvellous as it is to see, the glorious image of the Lord's face and the length of his entire and most noble body has been divinely transferred. So I would hope to try and build a picture here, ladies and gentlemen, of a shroud that existed long before the Middle Ages and was in existence and there's historical document documentation to testify to that. But here comes along the year 1204 and the shroud disappears for a hundred years. It then reappears in 1356. So I'll have go and have a coffee while you could read through those, read through those notes. You can see what we have here now is a complete documented um, chronological order of the place and location of the shroud from that time onwards up to present day. So, for the sceptic and the believer alike in the authenticity of the Shroud, both concur 
that the year 1356 is a historical fact and the shroud did exist at that time. In the year 1356, a man by the name of uh, Jacques de Charny is killed by the English at the Battle of Poitiers during a last stand in which he valiantly defends his king. He was a military man and de Charny had the, had the, uh, had the shroud in the family's possession. It was known at this time as the Shroud of Lyrae because it was in Lyrae. And it was in the possession of the de Charny family when Geoffrey Hachy, as a pronunciation in French, was killed. The shroud remains in the de Charny's family's possession until 1389. You can see this ingot that's been cast. This might have been for a feast day, for example, where the shroud would be on display. We can see the shroud's frontal and dorsal image. We can also see the box that contains the shroud. And you can also see this kind of hook thing in this amulet where the shroud would be pulled out to display the face of the shroud. And you can also see, I think it's maybe quite faint here, ladies and gentlemen, but you can see the flagrum as well, the, you know, the implement that would have been used to, to wound Christ. So in the year 1453, the shroud became the property of Louis, Duke of Savoy, eh, who then transfers it to Chambéry, which was the capital of his province. And this was a church that it was kept in. During the evening of December 3rd to 4th, a fire broke out in the church and the shroud was almost destroyed. Uh, globules of molten silver th fell through the box, piercing the shroud. And we can actually see these and we'll look at these in just a second. So this was a kind of first major fire that the shroud endured. Those three images, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom one is what you see today when you look at the shroud. Um, the middle image is the damage that has been sustained by those silver hot globules that made up the case of the shroud and you can see these triangulations and they're asymmetrical because you, if you were to imagine the cloth folded you know into four sections and those globules of silver falling through and that's where these holes come from and then at the very top this is probably what the shroud would have looked like had it not sustained any damage. In the year 1534, the poor Clare nuns repaired the shroud and put a backing cloth on it, which became known as the Holland Cloth. Uh, this took several months to complete and then the shroud was returned to the castle in Chambéry. And alas, in the year 1578, um, probably amid great pomp and circumstance, the shroud arrived in Turin which is where it's been kept to this day, and that's why we call the Shroud the Shroud of Turin. But the Shroud previously was the, sh the Shroud of Lyrae. If you were to go and see the Shroud on exhibition, I've had the honour and the privilege to go and see the Shroud in 2010. This is kind of what you would see, certainly on a feast day, um, when, Ma when ha Holy Mass has been celebrated. The, this particular picture, um, the person who's taken the picture has added a wee bit of kind of artistic license because the high altar that you see there is no longer there either because there was also another fire in Turin which nearly destroyed the shroud. So what does the shroud tell us? This is what we're trying to get into. This is what we want to try and explore. Does the shroud of Turin corroborate with the wounds that Christ sustained during his passion? Well, to answer this question, we have to go back to Holy Thursday and Good Friday where time is of the essence and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The scourging at the pillar, so well depicted in Mel Gibson's film The Passion of the Christ. If you haven't seen that film I would advise you, especially at this holy time of Lent, to watch this film and if it doesn't do anything for your faith there's no hope for you because we realise when we watch this film how brutal um, the, the, the wounds inflicted on our blessed Lord were. And we can see, of course, one of these implements, the flagrum that was used to lash at the victim when he was being scourged. And we also see in the, uh, we see these, um, the foretelling in the Old Testament of uh, the wounds that Christ would sustain when we say, I gave my back to those who struck me. The plowers ploughed on my back, they made their furrows long. And of course, we read in the Gospels, don't we, that Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. How many scourges do we see on the man of the shroud? And what limit was set on the number of scourges? Well, the Jews at the time, the Jews had a limit of 39 lashes. And those 39 lashes could systematically be done by two men on either side of the victim. But the Romans had no such limit. 
when we count the number of um, flagrum marks that we see on the back of the Man of the Shroud, we count no less than 120 lashes. So what that really means is the person, the Man of the Shroud, must have been close to death because the inflicting of the flagrum wounds was so brutalised. And it would have been the case that you could have taken a very powerful man, a carpenter, for example, and within one or two minutes, you could have reduced him to being a slave just by simply penetrating his back with a flagrum. He would have lost so much blood and so much energy with the pain that he would then behave like a slave and be obedient. And then we read that the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. The second um, torture inflicted on our blessed Lord. We know how the story unfolds, the passion story. Clearly Pilate didn't want to crucify him. He thought if I can really mess up Jesus in a really serious way, the crowds, that will be enough. We can then release him. But of course they wish to crucify him in a mockery of a trial. This uh, statue is probably more realistic as to how Christ would have looked um, after the scourging because we do, in today's world, we do have a sanitised version, don't know of how Christ actually looked. But we also remember in scriptures that we mentioned about him being unrecognisable as a human being. And of course then came the crucifixion which is what we would also expect to see on the Man of the Shroud if we can try and bring these two stories together. But when Jesus, when they came to Jesus and they saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came forth. It's an interesting observation, isn't it, from John, when we have the lancing of the side, when John appears, to, he seems to see water and blood pouring forth. And what I found very interesting about it, I felt it was necessary to put in this slide at this particular point. There's a thing called pericardial effusion in the world of medicine and biology. And when a person is subjected to extreme torture, a torture beyond probably anything we could ever imagine, the pericardium, which is the chamber, the sac that surrounds the heart, the pericardium becomes inflamed and it tends to gather more pericardial fluid, as it's called. And it's been known for victims of torture for this to happen to them. So could it be the case, this is something I'm proposing, could it be the case that when the lance went in, John was actually seeing pericardial fluid, which is a clear fluid mixed with blood from the heart, and he refers to it as blood and water poured forth. It's a speculation, but perhaps that's what it was. Christ would then have been taken down from the cross and obviously carried to the tomb. When this was happening, was he already in the shroud? This is open for debate. And if it was the case, um, how would the bloodstains appear if, that was, if this was how the story how, how it unfolded? Did the wounds of the Passion corroborate with the wounds found on the shroud? So this is what we're trying to do, to see if we can look at the shroud and categorically say, yes, this fits with the story of the crucifixion. The crowning with thorns, we can find on the victim of the shroud, we can see that the blood stains on the head, there's a back to front sort of, um, a back to front three as it were, and this is blood which has penetrated uh, the cloth itself. And we can also see when we look at the nape of the neck, just here where there's lots of fine nerve endings, this must have been excruciating for this person. We can see we have quite a severe amount of blood flow from the nape of the neck. So clearly the victim of the shroud was, had something on his head, possibly a crown of thorns. The crown of thorns might well have looked like this. To hold it in place, did they use a rope? Did they tie something? And maybe this is why we're seeing this back to front, back to front uh, sort of three shape. And what's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, again, I've just I've added bits and pieces as we go along here because there's so much to include in this. I found this very relevant, a Byzantine coin from the year 692 AD. When we look at this Byzantine coin that was minted then, um, we can see that with Christ, this depicts Christ, we can see we have this kind of shape at the top here, which looks like this back to front E. And the question I would propose is, did the 
person who forged the coin, did that person actually see the shroud at that time and kind of copy what you could see on the, on the forehead? I was very, very lucky to meet this uh, larger than life fellow, Justin Robinson, at a shroud conference last year. Um, Justin is a specialise, uh, specialises in ancient coins. There's a terminology for a person who specialises in ancient coins. Does anybody know what it is? Um, okay, because my memory slips at this point. So there is a name given to someone who specialises in coins from a thousand years ago. If you were asking me personally, it sounds like a really, really boring topic, but this, uh, this fantastic, remarkable man was able to bring this whole story to life with coins through history, which he believes uh, are very, very similar in depiction to the, sh the Man of the Shroud. This was me holding the coin, uh, the particular coin that I'd just shown you earlier. They then struck him on the head with a reed and spat at him. And again, we can see in this artist's depiction a far more realistic um, depiction of what the crown of thorns would have looked like and how it was more like a, like a helmet of thorns rather than something sort of, uh, something more simple. Such was the belief in the authenticity of the crown of thorns that King Louis XIV had um, La Chapelle built in this particular church which held the crown of thorns above the high altar. I would find it hard to believe that a king would build such a beautiful church for a particular relic that wasn't actually genuine. But I think as the years went past, of course, everybody wanted a, a relic to take home. So I think, you know, but as far as we know, the crown of thorns slowly dissipated. But as far as I'm aware, in Notre Dame, there are still some crowns that are kept uh, to, to view. The carrying of the cross, the man of the shroud appears to have carried a cross because we can see, um, we can see an aggravation on the, on the shoulder blades as though he's been carrying something. Um, did Christ carry the whole cross? That, again, that, this is up for debate. We, he was close to death. Could he have be, been able to carry a full cross or was it just the top section? Um, and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And interestingly, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the depiction earlier on of the crucifixion, there was a skull at the base of the cross. I don't know if you noticed that when I put this picture up, but the skull was, the skull represents the skull of Adam. It's believed that Christ was crucified on the spot where Adam had died. And this was relevant because Christ is the new Adam, as it were. We take Adam, the first man, Christ becomes the new Adam. Um, the section of the cross called the patibulum, this is possibly how Christ would have carried this. And this would explain the aggravation on the shoulder. We then have the nailing of the hands. Christ is then obviously put on the ground. He's nailed to the cross. We notice in this, um, on the man of the shroud, we notice the absence of thumbs and what I think is an extended right arm. And please remind me to mention that later on if I neglect to speak about the absence of the thumbs. There's a, a very poignant point regarding that and we'll discuss that later on. But we can see the wound actually appears to be in the wrist rather than the palm of the hand. We can also see the blood flow as well on the, on the arms. The man, of the, crowds, uh, the man of the shroud has been nailed on, has been nailed through the feet. We can see here, um, we can see one of the feet and perhaps the other one is slightly more obscure. There's also a fold in the cloth here because we can see what appears to be a sort of duplicate. Maybe I can just elaborate on that. Let's bring it up. There we are. Yeah, that's better. So that's maybe a clearer version of what we just looked at. So we can see part of the foot behind us, but we can see one of the foot, one of the feet um, very, very clearly. Again, a Byzantine coin from the year 869 AD shows Christ with one foot facing forward and one foot to the left. It's kind of an unusual depiction because you would expect a coin being forced just to have Christ with two feet, and yet one seems to be pushed to the side. Again, it's speculation. Did the person who forged the coin, did they look at the shroud and take this detail from that? It's believed by pathologists looking at the man of the shroud that the man of the shroud had one nail going through both feet, and there was a reason for that, which we will discuss in just a minute. <laughs> 
the piercing of his side, as we know, John noted that blood and water poured forth. Now, if we were to look at the wound on the side, here we are, this is the wound here, we can see again the blood has penetrated the cloth. If you think the blood, the, the pathologist can tell us that the the wound sustained is between the fifth and the sixth rib. Now, if you were to take a person being crucified, it would essentially mean that if the wound was sustained here and the heart was breached, then there's clearly going to, going to be a great loss of blood, particularly because we've severed the heart and severed the arteries of the heart. And this would cause the blood from the head to drain to this point. But then if you think about Christ being taken from the cross and been leaned over, you also have this blood, don't you, at the base of the body? which would then perhaps have the opportunity to be released when the body's actually turned on its side. And this might well explain why we see across the back of the man of the shroud, we see this sort of blood flow across the lower end of the back here. Again, it's speculation. Was this the result of the body being turned on its side as it was taken down from the cross? So, we cannot help but ask, who is this man of pain? Who is this person that we find on this shroud? And is this Jesus Christ? And can we be certain it's Jesus Christ? We'd mentioned earlier on that time was of the essence, because remember, this was Good Friday, it was Passover Friday, it was the feast of the Passover. And by Jewish law, everyone had to be in their homes by 6 p.m., now, Christ was crucified, as we know, and died at 3 p.m. But everything had to be hastened in order for everyone to be in their homes. In other words, it was important that Christ was crucified and was, uh, was killed quickly. It wasn't uncommon that victims of crucifixion could survive for days on the cross. They would even put seats under them so they could actually just alleviate muscles surrounding the lungs to make them last longer but it was important that Christ was crucified quickly and we'd mentioned earlier about one nail going through two feet it would make it far it would be much more difficult for the victim to breathe if he was having to push his weight on one nail through both feet rather than two separate feet so it seems to be the case that um, time was of the essence and everyone had to be home and Christ had to be dead and buried by the sixth uh, hour by 6 p.m. So one, just one final point, ladies and gentlemen. If some, some of you are still holding to the idea of the shroud covering the dead, the dead Christ and then being opened up, you would kind of expect to see something like this. If you think about it, if you were to take a cloth and wrap it and then open the cloth up, you end up with a kind of elliptical version of your true self. Whereas what we find on the shroud is a, a true three-dimensional image that seems to column it forward, as it were, rather than what you would expect if there was a natural contact with the body. So a quick summary um, from part one. It's in 12 parts. Just, it's in two parts. In summary, part one, okay, we have the victim of the shroud being crowned with a crown of thorns. I think most of you would agree that must have been a very, very rare thing. There's only one person in history that I have read of who was crucified with a crown of thorns. And of course, that is Christ. The second point, the victim of the shroud has been lanced, not in his left side, but in his right side. The third point, the victim of the cross has been taken down from the cross and given back to the family. It was not uncommon for victims of crucifixion not to be given back to the family. That was requested by Joseph of Arimathea. The body is unwashed. When pathologists and forensic examiners look at the shroud, the body was not washed. Again, we read in the Gospels, the women were returning on the Sunday to wash and anoint the body. The shroud was removed because there's no putrefaction. We don't find any decay on the shroud. The body has been taken away. And of course, the shroud that we see in Turin is a fine linen cloth from that age, from that era. Now, if you take just those six points that I've given you, this, was, this is without even looking at any kind of scientific evidence. Those six points, if you were to do a probability calculation on whether or not that is the shroud of Jesus Christ from that time, the probability is somewhat phenomenal. Now, what do I mean by that? Right? Let's just say, for example, I were to say to you, right, first century victim of crucifixion, 
were they crowned with? Were, what, was a, what was the probability of a person being crowned with a crown of thorns? Right, you might say that's a 1 in a 500 chance, just for example. What's the probability of the victim of crucifixion being given back to the family? You could say a 1 in 100. And if you were to do those probabilities and multiply them, just the way this particular uh, analyst has done, you get a staggering probability that it actually is Jesus Christ. In his particular calculation, he's got 200,000 million <laughs> to one, 200 billion to one, that the Shroud of Turin is the Shroud of Jesus Christ, just simply based on that analysis, without even looking at any modern science. The Shroud, of course, for centuries would have um, helped Christians to meditate on the passion, death and resurrection of Christ, and obviously enriched the church's teaching regarding his suffering. We now move on to the year 1898. So here we are all these centuries later and in Turin we have a, a lawyer actually, Secondo Pia, he was a lawyer but he was also an amateur photographer and he was given the, he was um, charged with the task of taking the first photographs of the Shroud of Turin. Thanks Father. Okay. Is that better everyone? I'll try and keep my head steady. <laughs> so the first photographs were taken in the year 1898. And Seconda, um, the picture's actually quite faint. There's, actually, there's a picture in the background there of Seconda with his camera, but back in those days, the cameras are this size, yeah? Um, so he duly went into the church and set up the camera. And back in those days, obviously the camera, you know, the cloth would be taken off and the camera would have to sit for quite some time to take the photograph. This was in a day, most young people don't remember the days of photographic negatives. My own children are like, what's a photographic negative? So when photography was invented, the photographer would go into the dark room with the plate and he would etch it with acetate chemicals, uh, silver nitrates, and then he would see the inversion of the tones of colour. And when Seconda Pia did this and took the photograph of the Shroud of the Turin and retired to his dark room to develop the, the picture. This was what he saw. And this, this was a lovely, um, just a very short word from Paul Cladell. He was a 19th century French poet. Uh, Paul Claudel says, The search for the face of God pervades all art, and the shroud represents the perfect, A.K. This is a difficult one to pronounce, A.K. Ropetios, which means an icon not made by human hands. That is, the effigy not created by the artist, but by divine intervention. That was from the poet Paul Claudel. We cannot help but be fascinated by what we now see when we take the shroud that we see the replica copy here and we take the inversion of tone so the darks become lights and the lights become darks and suddenly the shroud gives up its secret because whilst we're looking at a photogra photographic negative we're actually looking at a positive in the form of a negative and this is what Seconda Pia would have seen when he took the photographic negative of the entire front of the body of the shroud. How much more detail can we now see the guarding, the scourging with the lacerations on the back? How more prominent the bloodstains become in all the other wounds that we associate with the crucifixion? Going back to those coins, those Byzantine coins, here we have another two coins from 969 to 976. Um, Justin Robinson, the person I was telling you about, had commented that these coins were actually in mainstream production at that time. These weren't just like unique collector's coins, these were actually the coin of the day. You can see in this one here um, the depiction of Christ, but he has a swollen eye, and this is what we find on the man of the shroud. The eye is swollen, the right eye is swollen. Similarly with the next coin, 
we see Christ and he has a displaced septum in his nose. And that is precisely what we find, ladies and gentlemen, with the victim that we find of this, on the shroud. So the question would be thus, could a medieval forger craft such a magnificent fraud by, by creating a photographic negative that would appear as a photo, uh, that, that would appear, appear as a photographic positive when it was actually developed? Is that possible back in the Middle Ages? That's the question I would propose. And that being the case, if you were to look at this photograph of this lady, think about what it looks like when we look at the photographic negative and how much detail an artist or a forger would have to concoct to put this together. And of course, this would be done without paint, without brushes, without anything of that sort. And that's precisely what we find on the shroud. Is there anything else other than what we've discussed that could corroborate this story? Well, let's move to Spain. We're now in Spain. And in a church in Oviedo in Spain, we find a piece of cloth which is known as the Sedarium of Oviedo. I think Sedarium is Latin for napkin cloth. The Sedarium of Oviedo is roughly about 80 centimetres by 50 centimetres. It's not terribly impressive, I have to say. There's no magnificent, you know, facial depiction of Jesus Christ. It's simply a cloth that looks as though it's covered in bodily fluids, including blood. Nothing impressive there, but it's believed, and it has been believed since the very beginning, at least since the 5th century, that, is, that the Sedarium of Oviedo was the napkin cloth that covered the face of Christ in the tomb. Because again, going back to the Gospels, there were two cloths. There was a shroud that wrapped Christ, and there was also the napkin cloth that would have been used to absorb copious amounts of blood and body fluids. Mark Guskin is a great scholar on the Sedarium. If you can watch lots of stuff on YouTube regarding this, if you wish to know more about the Sedarium. Now, what I've done here, just to illustrate the point of why the Sedarium would be relevant and why it would connect in some way to the Shroud of Turin, you can see the Shroud, one of, one of the bloodstains of the Shroud on the left, and you can see the bloodstains of the Sedarium on the right. When the sedarium's folded in a particular way, we actually have a match. And furthermore, when we superimpose both, we get an exact match of the bloodstains, which indicates that the sedarium of Oviedo covered the same face of the same man that we find on the shroud. They both covered the same victim at the same time. And that's quite remarkable. Now, We can see here this was a Dr. Huyer and his wife. Um, he was the person who was a forensics expert in the States. And when he did what we've just discussed, he noticed over 130 congruent bloodstains, 130 bloodstains of which match. And he said that in an American court of law, it was something, for example, like 40 congruent bloodstains that would convict somebody, someone and send them to prison. And here we have the Shroud of Turin in the Sedarium of Oviedo, and we have 130 bloodstains, which is beyond any shadow of a doubt, therefore, the, the, the Shroud of Turin and the Sedarium have covered the same victim. But what does that mean? Well, that essentially means that the Shroud of Turin, rather than being claimed to be a 14th century forgery, can actually be traced back to the 5th century, because we have a documented uh, history of the Sedarium of Oviedo from the 5th century, and many of those archives are kept in Seville, where you've got correspondences between bishops, for example. We're now moving on to the modern era of science, and the Shroud in 1978 became the focus of um, NASA, of all you know, think tanks. NASA were very, very interested. They had developed a technology called the VP8 analyzer. It was used for topography, you know, for taking landscapes and what have you, and they were able to take pictures from aircraft and then translate them into three-dimensional images. So this was a whole new science that was being developed. One of the main proponents of this was Pete Schumacher, we can see here with the VP8 analyzer. Now, this type of technology 
would only work if there was three-dimensional information in the particular thing that was being analysed. Now, Pete Schumacher, I'll just move on to the next slide and then take you back. When he did this analysis, this VPA analysis with black and white pictures, he didn't get a true representation of a 3D image. You can see, for example, this man, how the nose has become deflated. So it's not a represent the nose not protruding the way it should. So this was not representative of this. And he's tried this with lots of black and white images, but of course, when he looked at the Shroud of Turin, he found the Shroud of Turin containing 3D characteristics. And this intrigued him enough to then put together a team which became known as STURP, Shroud of Turin Research Project. In 1978, the Vatican gave these great scholars, 30 or so of them, permission to go and look at the shroud in detail and to study it. And that was exactly what happened. And this happened in 1978. It was actually on the 400th anniversary of St. Charles Borromeo making a pilgrimage on foot to see the shroud. St. Charles Borromeo was a bishop and he believed his city had been spared the Great Plague, as it were, and made a pilgrimage to see the Shroud, to give thanks to God. Um, the story is he did it barefoot, <laughs> some 300 miles. We think our penances are hard these days, don't we? Think of Charles Borromeo. So this was really what sort of, um, this is what provoked the whole interest in the Shroud in 1978. This is some photographs, ladies and gentlemen, of the actual research. The team of scientists, 40 or so of them were given 126 hours round the clock. All the equipment was taken to Turin to do the analysis to try and ascertain what caused the image on the man of the shroud. Lots of different technologies, spectral analysis, ultraviolet fluoroscopy, lots of bits and pieces to try and get a better understanding. And this also allowed people beyond the Stuck project, for example, Fred Zagaby, who was a pathologist, with high resolution images, these other external professionals could then look at these images and then try and build their own picture of um, why the shroud was so enigmatic. For example, Fred Zagaby was looking, he was an expert in hand anatomy. He discovered that the man of the shroud has been nailed through the wrist between the carpal bones, just right here. And this, of course, would help take the weight of a body if the body was extended on the cross. It would also be a very, very good fixture point, but also would be very, very excruciating because it would sever the median nerve. Um, a point that I should mention just now before I neglect to mention it later. We spoke earlier on, remember, about the man of the shroud not having thumbs? Well, Fred Zagaby found that when he had victims of accidents and crimes, if they had the median nerve severed in the wrist, when the median there became severed, it caused a contraction of the thumb. And therefore, the th thumb would be held in of its own accord. And that's exactly what we find on the man of the shroud. We find he has fingers, but we don't see any thumbs. Could it be the case that the median nerve has been severed? And that is why we have the absence of the thumbs. So we now have, a, have a, some very, very brief evaluations with regards to the outcome this, this, of the particular disciplines during the Shroud Research Project. We would mentioned earlier, it is not the work of an artist. That's why it's so enigmatic. There are no artistic substances such as paint, ink, ink dye, pigments, or any stains found on the Shroud. Uh, this is confirmed by spectrographic, radiographic, and chemical tests. There's no evidence of an outline to the image the way you would find with a painting. Uh, there's no evidence of any paint binder that would be necessary to make a painting stick to the actual cloth itself, and so on and so forth. So we find when we read these, um, read these details, we just find that we cannot try and argue that this has been the product of some sort of artist who has been forging this. And mentioned earlier on, we find that the image is very superficial. You could literally take a small blade and scrape the image from the surface of the cloth. The blood um, is um, human blood. Blood chemistry indicates it's human blood. There's been 13 different tests to confirm that, to find things like haemoglobin, bilirubin, and so on and so forth. Um, the blood stains as well show the clear separation of blood and blood serum. So when we look at the shroud under ultraviolet fluoroscopy, we see that the blood, the, the, the blood serum is separated from the red blood cells, and that can be examined uh, using that particular type of technology. The blood is crimson red. I'd been reading about a great scholar who had 
had his doubts about the shroud and he spoke to a fellow pathologist who had recently discovered that when victims of extreme torture, um, when they die, it's found that the bilirubin enhances the blood, which then dries in a kind of crimson red colour. If you were to go and see the shroud today, the replica copy can't even do justice to it. The blood on the man of the shroud is bright, it's bright red. It's incredible, it's, bright, it's not brown, it's bright red. And there is a scientific, there's a pathological explanation as to why that's the case. Um, the shroud um, is the rare AB type. And I can see a guest in the audience tonight who was so kind when I was to give this talk in St. Mary's Cathedral last year to mention that this AB type tends to only be found in men who live in Jerusalem. So even we have a sort of corroboration with that. And it's also the same bloodstain that's found on the Sidarium of Oviedo. Um, the scourge marks and other A's of injury are loaded with bilirubin, which was what we mentioned earlier. Bilirubin is produced in copious quantities in victims of extreme torture, and that's what we find on the Man of the Shroud. This is an example where we use the ultraviolet fluoroscopy. When we look at the, the sort of light blue, the kind of cyan colour here, that is the bilirubin that is separated from the blood, and it can only be, de de it can only be detected with a technique called ul ultraviolet fluoroscopy. So we're really kind of pushing it here, aren't we, to say that some medieval forger understood this knowledge and was able to, you know, pull, that, pull this great forgery, pull this great forgery off. We also find pollen grains on the man of the shroud. There's actually 150 or so pollen grains. Many of them are found in the Middle East. Um, so again, it's a whole discipline where we have pollen experts looking at the shroud and finding pollens uh, from that area, but also pollens that are found in the historical trail where we join the dots of where the shroud had been over the two millennia. We can also find pollens from different areas where the shroud was. Textiles. The cloth is of Middle East origin. Uh, two by eight Syrian cubits, which was a Middle East unit of measurement. The different coloured bands of the shroud demonstrate ancient techniques of the preparation of the cloth that has been long discontinued by the Middle Ages. It's a typical herringbone weave that is found in the first century. So we would kind of have to, we would have to presume that the, if we had a forger, then the forger would have found a cloth from the first century to perpetrate the forgery. To my mind, that being highly unlikely. And of course, image science, we have, I guess we've just looked at the image science, we can find that the shroud has got 3D characteristics. Uh, the shroud is a photographic negative that appears as a positive when we go from this to this. And the image is purely superficial on the surface of the cloth, resulting from a dehydrated carbohydrate layer, which no one to this day can explain. Some further information, Budapest National Library manuscripts dating from 1190, which is way before the 13th century, ladies and gentlemen. We find depictions of the uh, Passion and Crucifixion of Christ. We can see in those paintings. Let me just look at one of these in particular. I'm going to just, I think I can highlight this. Um, there we go, that's me. I've managed to enlarge that. So we've got in this Budapest National Library, these manuscripts, these pre manuscripts, we can see the herringbone weave, which is synonymous with what we see on the shroud. It's a herringbone linen cloth. And we can see, can you see those three holes there? They're known, without, they're known within shroud circles as the three poker holes. But we can see these three holes that are result, uh, the result of damage to the shroud. But we also see the same three holes on the victim of the shroud. So the person who painted these illustrations must have seen the Shroud of Turin in order to paint the illustration the way we see it. Again, this is two centuries before the 13th century. Needing the final part of the talk, carbon dating. Ha ha, yes, it's a forgery. The carbon dating proved it to be a forgery. So this is where the story kind of takes a turn. Um, carbon dating if you're not familiar with that, and I'm not wanting to go into any kind of detail with it, but let's just say carbon dating is a technique that's used to date how old organic uh, specimens are. So something that's organic can be carbon, carbon tested. 
This process can be effective up to five to 10,000 years. Every laboratory has, has its kind of own analysis. Can't be dated for things over with you know, hundreds of thousands of years, but certainly over the past five to 10,000 years, the consensus is that carbon dating would be relatively accurate. I have to confess I've got my own scepticism towards it, but let's, let me just be given to the fact just now that the shroud was carbon dated, and let's look at the outcome of that. So here we are, we're now moving on to 1988, 10 years after the shroud project, and the Vatican, the interest in the, sh the shroud was at fever pitch. The whole scientific community was looking at the shroud and wondering, is this the shroud of Christ? And many, many scientists were starting to be given to the idea that Christianity was actually, is actually true. So shroud, there was shroud fever in 1988, massive, massive interest from every aspect of the scientific community. And the Vatican, under Pope John Paul II, gave permission for the shroud to be carbon tested. And you can actually see the photograph of where the cloth is being cut. Now this, I cannot do justice tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to the shenanigans that's involved in this, because I do believe there was an ulterior motive. And you might say, oh, he's going down the realms of conspiracy here. It's all very, it's, it's very, very evident now, because we've now got a lot of evidence, that, that information that's been released, that we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago to indicate that this wasn't conducted properly. The carbon-14 fiasco, so if I can just try and give you it simply, the cut from the bottom corner, at the bottom left corner, if I can maybe just find the, I'll go back to it in just a second, we'll, we'll look at the actual cutting point, we can see it on the replica. But essentially, the cloth was cut, in, cut into five particular segments, and three of those segments were sent to three laboratories, and we can see them here. There was Arizona, Oxford, and Zurich, and those, Laboratories did three separate carbon dating tests and then they come back with their dates and we can see the dates here within the, we've got a time we've got a kind of we've got a time period with an error margin as well. And then they took the average of these three time periods and that was what they presented to the world as the actual true age of the Shroud of Turin. This was the three men involved. We've got Ed Hall, um, we've got uh, Michael Tight. And we've also got uh, Professor Robert Hedges. Now, something I should have mentioned as well, this, the task of this, um, you know, incredibly, you know, um, significant test in the 1980s, it was given to the British Museum because they were seen as the bastion of truth and greatness and everything else. You used to have to look at the, the British Museum building. They were given the task of all the laboratories in the world and of all the institutions. The Vatican employed them to do the carbon test. And this was the three men who were involved. And this went to press in 1989. You can see this with the blackboard behind them with the date 1260 to 1390. I don't think it's a, um, by any coincidence there's an exclamation mark after, after it, isn't it? And probably three unhappy looking men. I found this very interesting. When I was doing some research for this some time ago, I came across this article from The Telegraph from 1989. And it says, on Good Friday, March 25th, 1989, 45 businessmen and rich friends presented to Ed Hall of Oxford £1 million for his services in having determined the Shroud of Turin to be a medieval fake. He was going to use the funds to create a new chair of archaeological science to be filled by his friend, Dr Michael Tite. So businessmen paid £1 million for these three men for having established the Shroud of Turin to be a medieval forgery. Now, is it just means there's something about the body language here? The arms folded. So, of course, following this, the shroud faded into oblivion. That is exactly what happened. And the interest in the shroud, the shroud fever that we discussed, completely dissipated. And anyone you met, what do you think of the shroud of Turin? Huh, it's a medieval forgery. And this is what we hear even to this day. And that's very sad, ladies and gentlemen, because think about what we've discussed for the first half of the talk, all of those historical aspects, but especially the Sedarium of Oviedo, the, the napkin cloth. We have all this evidence and the coins and everything else, and we have the British, British Museum giving us the carbon test result. And we've got kind of one versus the other. So all the historical evidence has essentially been discarded in favor of what they claim is this infallible carbon test. And this is where we have an issue. Now, 
at the end of the presentation, I'm going to leave a, a website that I would you know, emphatically ask you to look up if you want to try and get a better knowledge of what happened during this whole carbon-14 fiasco. But essentially, when we got nearer the carbon test, all the rules were changed by the three men in particular that we referred to. We call these protocols which were abandoned. There were meant to be multiple sample areas for the cloth to be taken from because if you want to get a good analysis of this cloth and the age of the cloth, you can't just take from one corner. And that's exactly what they did. They took from one corner and split it into three and sent it to the laboratories. There was meant to be a simultaneous comprehensive examination. So when they took the sample, they were meant to check in the sample to see if the sample had any, any materials that would indicate that it wasn't pure. For example, was there any dyes in it? Could it have been repaired? You know, the shroud through its ages was repaired. Was this checked? Seven laboratories were supposed to participate. Robert Hedges changed that to three, three laboratories. Blind testing, they were meant to take a cloth of the first century and blind test that with the laboratories. That was not done either. And there was meant to be no conferring between laboratories. That was not done either. So all these protocols at the last minute were abandoned. And this, this was to the surprise of other scientists who were looking upon the unfolding of this situation. A significance level calculation, I'll just give you this for the layman. How many are here tonight? 50 people. So I hand out a measuring tape to 50 of, to everyone. Everyone gets a measuring tape and I ask you to measure the length of the church. Okay, that seems reasonable. 20 metres, 21 metres, 19 metres, 17 metres, 22 metres. Now, if we did that, I'm sure you would agree that something's quite significant there. You might say, we're looking at something like 20 metres. But if I were to do that experiment, and these were the results, 20 metres, 55 metres, 2 metres, 100 metres, you would agree something has went badly wrong with the analysis. And this is exactly what statisticians do when they take data. They talk about a significance level calculation. What I'm really saying is, when we go from 100% to 0%, we can take data from any situation and work out if the data is reliable. When the data was taken from the Shroud of Chirin and analysed, it came in at 0.24%. And we know that statisticians will take 5% and below and reject it. And here we have the shroud, those measurements from those three labor laboratories reading at 0.24%. And that's not the end of the story, unfortunately, because through a Freedom of Information Act, only, five, only seven years ago, an Oxford uh, analyst, statistical an analyst, was able, to, he had to use a Freedom of Information Act to the British Museum to access the data that was presented in 1988. And this was the data here, you can see, when you're looking at this, for example, um, 606, that means 606 years old, just to clarify that from, from 1988, that takes it back to the, the 13th century. So we have the data here, plus or minus the number of years, from all three laboratories. But what we find is that the data that was presented at the time was the data in yellow and not the data in white. But through a Freedom of Information Act, we were able to access the real data, which was different from the reported data. Right, so what's the question? Why would somebody lie about the data? Why would the British Museum lie? And to this date, they've been asked, and nobody's been forthcoming to explain why they would lie about the data. But what the data being changed did was it took that 0.24 that we spoke about, and it took it up to 4.18. Now, it's not quite 5%, but it's almost there. But even regardless, if it's 5% or less, the data gets discarded. And this is what we find when we look at the data that was reported on from the British Museum. A real travesty of uh, justice here. Sometimes God can raise the lowly, can't he? This is the most, this is the, it's almost... Yeah, this is humorous. This is a great, I love telling this part of the story. Here we have Sue Benford. Sue Benford was watching the TV some 20 years ago and saw a documentary on the Shroud, fell in love and says, my goodness, it's the face of Jesus. And then, as a practicing nurse, then became a kind of Shroud 
scholar. She began to learn about the Shroud. You know, she lived and breathed it. She wrote papers on it. And this is one of the papers. I have it here tonight. You can print this online. But, of course, Sue, like everyone else, became very, very disenfranchised when she realised that the Shroud was a medieval forgery. And she said, how can this be? So she took it upon herself to look at the data and the photographs that were produced from the research project in 1978. And she noticed under certain spectral analysis, parts of the shroud would glow in different colours under certain camera light. And Sue made the claim that the actual part that the shroud had been taken, that the, the part of the cloth that had been cut for analysis was actually a repair from the Middle Ages. Can you believe that, that someone with no academic credentials could claim this? Not only did she claim that, she wrote a paper to support her position. So the story is that Barry Swartz, he was the photographer on the Shroud project. So Barry phones Professor Ray Rogers, Nobel Prize chemist, right, big gun here. Barry Swartz phones Ray Rogers, hi Ray, we've got a problem. What's the problem, Ray? We've got someone from the lunatic fringe, that's how they referred to people who still believed in the authenticity of the Shroud. We have a problem. Um, this lady, Sue Benford, is claiming that the sample that was taken was from a reweave of the Middle Ages. Ray Rogers says, that, that's gotta be, it's gotta be, can't be true. But he'd kept his own sample, a very, very small sample. He says, give me five minutes. And Ray Rogers, Julie, took his sample, put it under the microscope, and five minutes later, phoned Barry Swartz, the official Shroud photographer, called him back and says, Barry, she was right. He found cotton in the sample. Cotton was a modern invention, as a modern invention. Not only that, when Ray Rogers began to look at the sample area, all of these particular things, Madder Root Dye, Alan Morden, all these particular things that are used for repairs, especially in the Middle Ages, were found in the sample. So the British Museum had conducted the carbon test and had not checked, had not followed the protocol to check to see if there was contamination. And Sue Benford was right all along. So Ray Rogers, I'll give him his due, he had the humility to swallow his pride and say, yeah, we've got it completely wrong. And he then requested that a reanalysis be conducted at some point in the future. The bunk in the shroud, ladies and gentlemen, yes, I would be delighted if I, if I, could, if I could present 10 slides to you to show potential debunkings of the Shroud. To this day, I cannot find one single thing on the internet that I could show you. This is probably the best one I found. And this one was found years ago. And this is how it's claimed that Leonardo uh, da Vinci faked the Shroud of Turin. Uh, it doesn't stand up to any kind of scrutiny. When I read this article, <laughs> the first thing I did was look at when Leonardo da Vinci lived. <laughs> you know, um, he was born in 1452. And um, as we know, the Shroud was in the de Charny family's possession in 1356. The, this poor gentleman spent all this time doing this drawing and didn't check Leonardo da Vinci's uh, date of birth. Maybe if Leonardo could time travel, maybe he went back in time and forced the Shroud, who knows. David Rolfe, fantastic Shroud scholar. Um, he has challenged the British Museum. One million pounds he will give, one million dollars. Uh, to anyone who can recreate the Shroud in modern times. And that challenge has now actually been extended to America. Of course, the British Museum are completely silent because nobody can replicate the Shroud of Turin. So to finish off, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, go I'm going to give you the attributes of the master forger. If we're still given to the fact that someone in the Middle Ages did this, this is the qualities this particular person had. They've got an exceptional knowledge of anatomy. They've got access to fresh blood from a victim of torture and are knowledgeable in understanding fresh versus post-mortem blood. They've been able to acquire a first century expensive linen cloth from the East for the purpose of creating the forgery. They have a mastery of photography, 750 years before photography is invented, and the principles of light inversion and photographic development techniques. And they can encode detailed and anatomical information that they are unable to see with their own naked eyes whilst they perform the process. They have traveled to the East to obtain over 150 pollen samples and they've dotted them about the shroud to make it look good for us unsuspecting individuals 750 years later. And they've even been to the gate of Jerusalem 
and found a very, very rare calcite salt that's found on the knees of the man of the shroud as though he had fallen at the gate of Jerusalem to make the image even more impressive. This forger is also an expert in hematology too. This person is really, really clever. They're aware of bilirubin bile and the ultraviolet fluoroscopy technique to observe it and they must have access to some sort of digital equipment uh, for example, a variable digital frequency adjustment facility, and so on. The shroud bloodstains of the head match the sedarium of Oviedo, so I'm being facetious now, perhaps they travelled in time and were able to bring both together. They've applied over 400 bloodstains to the cloth without a painting process, and then incredibly, they add the image which superimposes on top of it. So when we look at the man of the shroud, the bloodstains were laid first, 400 anatomically correct bloodstains with the shroud laid afterwards. The forges have advanced post 21st century technology, including an atomic laser. I could go on and on, couldn't I? To try and illustrate what kind of forger we're dealing with here. Great character, isn't he? Sherlock Holmes, yes, one of my favourites. I was so blessed to be introduced to Basil Rathbone at such a young age, and I think it's just kept me right. This has got to be one of the best quotes. After all, dear Watson, once you've eliminated everything that is impossible, whatever is left, no matter how improbable it is, must be the truth. And that's called scientific analysis, which is what we seem to have lost these days. In 1981, when 40 members of STUP, the research project, held a symposium in New London, Connecticut, to discuss the results of their investigations. Someone then asked the 40 scientists sitting on the stage, all who believe this is the authentic shroud of Christ, raise your hands. 40 pairs of eyes just stared at him. Okay, he said, all those who don't believe this is authentic, raise your hands. 40 of us still remained silent. None moved. He was frustrated and hostile. Because if you profess a belief in the shroud, your career could run into some difficulties, yes. So finally, yeah, it's out there. Could the image on the surface of the shroud be the result of the resurrection? It's a hypothesis. Is it, can it, should it, is it worth investigating? Well, why not? You know, we believe in the supernatural. Well, that's exactly what a team of scientists in Italy are doing just now under a professor, uh, uh, Paolo de Lazaro. They have been taking a small one centimetre piece of cloth, very, very similar to the shroud, and exposing that to a thing called an eczema laser. So it's kind of like small blips of ultraviolet light. And when they expose this small piece, only one centimetre, they can eventually, by these staggered interruptions of ultraviolet light, they can eventually get it to discolour, very similar to what we see on the shroud. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, they're only doing it with one small centimetre, one small square centimetre. Now, Professor Palio de Lazaro, when he looks at the entire shroud and he calculates the surface area of the shroud and the amount of energy that would be required to create the imprint, and I'm not exaggerating this, this is in the order of billions of watts, billions and billions of watts of energy over the shortest time frame, because if the ultraviolet light is pulsed too quickly, the, shro the shroud, the cloth discolours more than it should. So he believes that if we take some sort of um, event horizon, for example, 140, 140th of a nanosecond, that's a small, think about a one second, think about a half a second, quarter of a second, go into a nanosecond, 0 0.000000001 second. Think how quick that second is. And he says that is what happened when the shroud was formed with the most incredulous amount of energy, probably more than all the atomic bombs that we find on the world today. Kenneth Stevenson famously said, after he had examined it, and Kenneth Stevenson was one of those shroud members. He went to Italy, he went to Turin. He thought, this is great, I'm you know, going on a trip to Turin with the wife for the weekend and we'll find the brush strokes and everything will be tickety-boo. We'll show the forgery, we'll come back home. And here he is, 50 years later, still facing that same, that same mystery. Kenneth Stevenson says, What better way, if you were a deity, of regenerating faith in a sceptical age 
than to leave evidence 2,000 years ago that can only be defined by the technology available in that sceptical age. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'll leave this slide up because this is maybe one you would like to take a picture of. Um, a new movie has been produced. It's definitely the foremost movie of its day regarding the Shroud of Turin. And it also talks about the carbon dating fiasco that I had outlined very briefly. Um, the website is www.whocanhebe.com, just all lowercase, whocanhebe.com. And on this website, you will find this new movie by David Rolfe called Who Can He Be? And David Rolfe, you saw a picture of him earlier. David Rolfe, fantastic syndonologist, really very, very inspiring, especially for someone like me who's kind of in a learning process just now on the periphery. Met him, met him last year, wonderful individual, and, and also a convert to the Catholic faith. Um, David Rolfe has also extended the one million pound, the one million dollar challenge to America to try and debunk the Shroud of Turin. So, that concludes the talk. You've been a fantastic audience. Uh, I've probably ran way over the time. Um, I hope you found it interesting. I hope that it's given you a kind of working knowledge of the Shroud. Um, the talk could have been focused on just one particular thing, for example, the carbon dating, but I think it's better to give a general overview so that when you leave tonight, at least you can see where the arguments for in favour of the Shroud versus the arguments against it. But as I mentioned, um, you have to watch some of the other videos on this website and it will take you into detail on how much um, subterfuge that the British Museum was incorporating when they perpetrated that great um, carbon date fraud on the Shroud of Turin.